Hello, uh, my name is Reinhard Bündgen. I'm from IBM and, well, I'm an architect working on crypto and on confidential computing for Linux on the IBM Z platform. And my task is to keep you awake one after lunch. <laughs> the talk is about hardware security modules and confidential computing. So, well, I know there are quite a few who are concerned about and knowledgeable about confidential computing. Here's my question, who knows what a hardware security module is? Very good, I'm impressed. I will give, uh, nevertheless, a small intro on hardware security module and on my personal view on hardware security modules as well as uh, secure execution, but I keep it fast because we want to look at the combination which is non-trivial. Okay, what's a hardware security module? Some hardware device performing crypto in a secure way, in a secure way that it meaning that it protects key material. Yes, uh, the key material uh, means the keys are never visible in plain text inside a computer system. They are protected and there are two methods to protect them. Either the hardware security module has some wrapping key inside it that is used to wrap all key operational keys or the hardware security module has a big table of keys and identifiers that can be used by the program. These are the two methods I am aware of. If someone knows the third one, I would be interested in learning it. Okay, a good hardware security module is uh, certified, typically against FIPS 140-2 or 3 these days. It's temper respondents and therefore it needs level 2 and above. Yes, and the idea of a hardware security module is to render key material, a key object, useless without the access to that hard, very hardware security module. <clears throat> well, confidential computing, we know it's about running a piece of code as a black box inside of some hosting software. A black box means uh, no state of that piece of code is known and I think the today the majority of confidential computing solutions for this, this piece of code is a virtual machine. That makes things easier. The only uh, confidential computing that I'm aware of that is different is uh, Intel's SGX which can go with arbitrary pieces of code. And you see uh, all uh, major hardware Providers have a confidential computing solution. Just over lunch, I added the last one, risk five. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, what is confidential computing about? About confidence, about trust. So that is uh, my word of cloud computing. There are the olden days where the customers has a traditional trust model and it's about policies, about contracts, he just, the uh, cloud clients just believes the cloud provider that he, the cloud provider is doing the right thing. He has some kind of contract with the CEO. The CEO inside its organization has hop hopefully policies to convince the operators to do the right thing. And the CEO again uh, trusts the hardware provider. With a confidential computing model, that's different. Oh, well, I should say, uh, Given that model, whoever attacks the <coughs> operator, be it that he bribes the operator, be it that uh, he threatens the operator, has a chance to get inside uh, the provisioned uh, software, even if the cloud provider uh, originally is a good guy. Uh, with the uh, confidential uh, computing trust model, the idea is that the cloud uh, Client only trusts the hardware vendor. That the, the hardware vendor, of course, needs uh, secure uh, supply chains uh, inside, have also its policies that things work fine. But after all, it's only the hardware vendor 
The cloud provider has no influence in looking into the workload. The only thing, and it was mentioned before, that you cannot protect against is a denial of service attack. The easiest one of the cloud provider would be just not start the workload. Nothing we can do about it without uh, complicated cluster mechanisms, of course. <clears throat> okay, why do we use HSMs? Um, and uh, what is the es essence of an HSM? Um, well, the, the sad answer is, I guess, 90% or even more of uh, the companies who use HSMs do use HSMs because they must. Some, some legal obligations uh, require them to use the HSMs and they won't just uh, have the check mark done. Um, but there's a security reason behind HSMs anyway. And that is uh, why I am talking at a security conference about HSMs. Um, an HSM is a means to protect cryptographic keys from being used outside of your system. Yes. So HSM is about security, about securing keys, but it does not help you if some intruder somehow gets into your system and uses these keys, these key objects inside your system. Because inside your system, you would have access to your HSM that is connected to your system. So an HSM is mainly a protection against what I call an offline attack. Someone somehow gets hold of your keys, steals them, and uses them on their own system. How could you steal a key? Maybe a key uh, stored on an unprotected disk. Maybe with an attack like Heartbeat that you could just extract some me memory uh, from a system, possibly without, without you realizing it, that it happened doesn't matter. And uh, so that, that is the kind of uh, protection. And in that case, the key or whatever key material is stolen must be useless. And therefore, the HSM must be something that you own, something that only you can use when you have access to your HSM. It's a device that renders key, stolen keys useless. Just as a simple example, we have an application that uh, encrypts some data, sends end-to-end -end encryption, sends the end-to-end uh, -end encrypted data to a storage server. If an attacker uh, steals the brown encryption key, he could sniff the wire or even get to the storage server, get the data, and decrypt it. Now, if that uh, key is uh, protected by an HSM, that's the violet uh, <coughs> ellipse around the key, the protection, then a uh, thief who steals that key has no chance to use that key outside of the actual system that is connected to the HSM. So what is wrong with using a HSM in a non-trusted cloud? Well, the stealing of the HSM is so easy, in particular for the uh, providers of the cloud, for the operators of the cloud. It's just a matter of reassigning the HSM to another system. It becomes particularly simple in a virtualized system when it's just a management operation. You do not even have to replug an HSM. And well, some HSMs are uh, plug aware, so they would destroy themselves if they get a uh, ripped of a machine. In a virtual system, it's just a piece of software layers inf informing the firmware route the traffic to a certain uh, virtual server. So <clears throat> stealing an HSM is very easy in a virtualized system. What's even more, what's a virtual system? But we ca can get to that later when we look at the attacks that are possible. Now, um, uh, we could use a PIN. Remember your credit cards? They are protected against stealing with a PIN. But, well, um, in a server system, sorry, I'm, I'm coming from a big company. I'm, we are not dealing with PCs. Our customers want to have these huge, huge things. And they run uh, multiple servers 
in a server farm on a system. Uh, so interactive uh, entry of uh, pins is a no-no on, in such, on such server systems. And even that would leave a little period of time where there could be an attack. So uh, we must uh, store the pin somewhere. Well, and storing the pin somewhere without a special protection is like writing your pin on the back of your credit card. It, can be stole, it could be stolen as easily from your system as the key material can be stolen. So next option, network HSMs. Um, well, <coughs> in order for the network HSM to be owned by you, you must authenticate yourself to your network HSM. Well, we know, hopefully everybody in this uh, room knows, to authenticate without a physical secure connection, the only way is to have some secret, to have a protocol based on a secret. Where do you put that secret? It's as typically as easily stealable as uh, your key material, and we have the same problem. Yes, you can put the secret on a stored disk, and this is the key to uh, uh, secure the disk must be then somewhere, so we get this uh, infinite recursion. So <clears throat> we have that problem that cannot easily be solved. Before we look into a solution to this problem, I want to describe three types of attacks to you. Attack number one would be just to... Uh, <coughs> these are attacks that work in a virtual server. So HV stands for hypervisor, and what I call guest is uh, what other people call a virtual machine. Um, so um, we have this guest that is connected to an HSM inside the firmware. There are the request queues. You can imagine, uh, since these are typically uh, black, uh, black devices, so they are asynchronous, you send a request and get a result some that you can fetch at a later uh, point in time, typically. So what can happen during the operation of my guest one, even during the uh, submission of a request that the ownership of the, or the access to the HSM can be switched to a different guest. So that guest A uh, sends a request to the crypto card and guest B could read the result. That is something we have to protect against. Or any other kind of, that would allow guest B to sniff to the communication of guest A with its HSM. That is attack one. Attack two, would be, well, a, a double uh, attack. Namely, the stealing of the secure key, the secure key object. I put a, a, the a green, uh, a dark green um, <coughs> ellipsis, is the uh, binding of the key to the uh, master key in the HSM, the wrapping key that's in the HSM. I could steal that key, and at the same time, I could uh, steal the HSM in which case I could use this uh, uh, secure key on the attacker could use uh, the uh, secure key on the HSM. That's another attack. The last attack that we have to deal with is if someone uh, prepares an HSM with the master key that someone, this attacker knows, and then lets you use uh, the uh, HSM of the attacker, so that you run uh, your software with the wrong HSM, you think your keys are protected, but they are protected in a way that an attacker can interpret the keys. Okay, we let's settle these uh, attacks a little bit. I will come back to them before I get now into the solution. I have to talk a little bit about the uh, kind of uh, hardware and uh, confidential computing solutions we have on uh, IBM Z and Linux One system. Uh, our HSMs are, they are pluggable cards. That's a picture of them. Uh, they are, uh, they can be used as HSMs and they are prepared for virtualization. So they can be configured to 
be up to 85 virtual HSMs. So they have different partitions. Each partition has, has a partition-specific uh, master key, and these virtual HSMs uh, can be con, uh, assigned to different virtual machines. And we can actually talk uh, to the HSM. The virtual machine can talk to the HSM in pass-through mode. So that's uh, interpreted by the firmware directly and not, this, uh, not intercepted by the hypervisor. Okay, uh, I mentioned already we use the type with the master key where our secure keys are actually keys, operational keys wrapped by the master key. The assignment is done uh, via, uh, from the uh, system itself. And yes, uh, we have a master key, so it's something that's configurable. Therefore, I should <coughs> shortly mention how such a uh, HSM is configured. We have something that we call Trusted Key Entry Console. That's a lockdown computer, if you so want. This is the plate uh, form factor that comes with smart card readers and smart cards that allows you to configure the domains of our Crypto Express adapters. There's a secure channel uh, between this uh, trusted key entry console and the actual HSM, the plugged in uh, HSM. The, uh, uh, the uh, <coughs> admin of a domain would can generate uh, the master key in multiple parts. Uh, there, that allows to have a multiple I uh, <coughs> policy running and um, it's, uh, this, these are either generated on the smart cards or on an HSM that's inside this trusted key entry console, and then via a secure protocol, uh, it's uh, sent to the card, and the card is configured that way. One thing in a solution where the HSM should be used in a cloud, the, <coughs> the admin of such a domain, of the domain, must be trustworthy. Yes, if there's a trustworthy domain admin, that a non-trustworthy non domain admin, that non-trustworthy domain admin could somehow implant keys that he more or less knows, and that is uh, detrimental to your security. So, um, next, a few words on secure execution for Linux. That is the confidential computing uh, solution for IBM Z, and as the name says, it only works with Linux and Linux KVM as a hypervisor. Um, I th think uh, different to most other solutions, uh, secure execution um, start, can start encrypted guests, guest images. So the images can already contain a secret. Um, the um, well, the firmware layer that implements a trusted uh, execution environment is called Ultravisor on IBM Z. The Ultravisor has access to the root of trust for secure execution, which is a so-called so uh, host key. That's a private key of which the uh, public key is published, and each image is generated with the help of the public key, and only the Ultravisor can interpret the image and get the image encryption key and then uh, uh, starts a secure execution guest. I think uh, that is, well, the, other than that, of course, for secure execution guest, uh, all state is protected while the secure execution guest is running. Uh, in the <clears throat> later release, in, this, in the current release of our hardware, we have uh, support for remote attestation. Uh, the interesting thing about that is, as a result of the remote attestation request to the ultravisor, you get a unique uh, configuration ID that is a unique ID of the running guest instance. That way you can check whether two guests that you connect to are actually the same instance or not. Okay. Given the confidential computing uh, promises, uh, 
that we, you do not have to trust uh, the hypervisor and hypervisor admin or hardware admin. We didn't implement uh, <clears throat> HSM support to begin with, and this came only uh, recently, actually spring of this year. So, <clears throat> how does the solution look like? Protection against attack number one. This protection establishes a binding between a guest and the HSM. Now, we have to <clears throat> understand such a binding isn't possible without confidential computing because how virtualization works is that actually the hypervisor maintains the guest. So it, the hypervisor maintains all the significant things that make up the guest, the page tables, the pages, the CPUs, all the states. And since the hypervisor uh, manages this, with every interception, the hypervisor can actually remodel the guest as it wishes. A malicious hypervisor can do everything with the guest. So from a system perspective, a guest, <clears throat> there is no crypt to a guest that changes with, with confidential computing, there, there must be some firmware, uh, typically around make, making up the trusted uh, execution environment, that maintains the guest, that uh, keeps the memory uh, unmodifiable by the uh, hypervisor, the uh, CPU setups, and uh, all other kind of state. So now, all of a sudden, the firmware has something that makes up a guest once the guest is started. So it can establish a binding between a guest or between all the structures that the ultravisor uh, maintains to specify the guest and that the hypervisor cannot modify. And uh, once a uh, um, HSM is bound, no other guest can access this HSM as long as the binding persists. As another measure uh, to make sure that a secure guest cannot mistakenly talk to a HSM that is not bound, the ultravisor will uh, disallow any communication between the secure guest and a HSM that is not bound to that secure guest. Okay, uh, there are of course means to forcefully uh, ch change, <coughs> undo the, uh, well, move the uh, HSM to a different guest, but that implies a reset and will automatically undo the binding. And undoing the binding uh, comes with a uh, reset that will clear the communication path. So it kind of can be a denial of service attack, but uh, it will not be uh, a security leak. Um, yes, if you don't have an HSM, but just an accelerator card, that is sufficient, that binding, to uh, protect against attacks. Attack number two. <clears throat> Here things become a little bit more complicated. Remember, attack number two was this double theft of the HSM and the uh, secure keys. Or what we do here is we let the ultravisor maintain a secret, I call, we call it association secret, and we bind the uh, keys not only to the master key, but also to the association secret. And uh, the ultravisor enforces that all requests to the HSM that involve a secure key must be, <coughs> can only be sent to an HSM that is associated with this association secret. What we technically do is we uh, set up a session in our EP11 adapter, but uh, that is something if you can ask me about uh, uh, during the breaks. So, <coughs> the association, okay, and uh, secondly, whenever a key is generated, uh, on an, in an association, in an associated uh, HSM, then that key is bound to the association secret. 
Other than that, whenever you reset an adapter, when you unbind an adapter, the adapter is implicitly also de-associated. So the session is ripped down. And clearly, you can only set up associations if you have first bound the adapter. Yeah. Note, association is only needed for requests that contain a secure key, either a cryptographic request, please sign, please encrypt, or a key generation request where the cryptographic, where the secure key is in the result. Um, uh, some management requests, including setting master keys, can be routed uh, to adapters that are only bound and not associated. And of course, queries uh, to the crypto adapter. Who are you? What is your master key verification pattern? Just to find out what HSM do I talk to? The uh, last attack is something firmware cannot do, do much about. It's something that the software has to deal with. Uh, namely, whenever you want to trigger an association, you better make sure that the uh, crypto adapter is the one that you think you're talking to. The master key verification pattern, which is some kind of hash or uh, an encryption of a predefined pattern uh, that uh, characterizes uh, the crypto configuration, can be used for this. So uh, for our crypto adapters, uh, there's a sysfs entry where you can find out the master key verification pattern of the system. And if that is the one that you are expecting, you can do the association. Um, uh, for OpenCryptoKey, which is uh, implementation of the PKC11 standard, for the uh, HSMs that uh, we support, these are the EP11 adapters, uh, we have a configuration that allows the EP11 token to only uh, let uh, key generation um, functions succeed if the resulting key was generated with the right master key verification pattern, which is inside uh, uh, the key, which is inside the uh, readable part of the key. So. Next problem, I just postulated there is some association key in the metadata of the secure guest that the ultravisor maintains on the on behalf of the secure guest. That key has to, or this secret has to get into the ultravisor somehow and has to get there in a safe way. Uh, what you can do is you can send what we call an at secret request structure or an at secret request control block uh, and, um, well, actually you would send it to, this, uh, to the secure guest and the secure guest then would call an instruction to forward this request to the ultravisor. And this instruction is not interceptible, so it would, would go right into to the firmware without being intercepted by the hypervisor. This uh, uh, structure uh, con is... Uh, ASGCM uh, encrypted, so it has a uh, confidential part that is encrypted and a um, additional data part which is only integrity protected. The uh, association secret is of course in the encrypted part, its ID is in the uh, open part. There's another uh, secret in the encrypted part that I talk later about. Um, the um, Request contains a measurement of the image, so it can only be used with, with specific images. There is other data that I will talk later about, and it contains so-called key slots. The key slots uh, contain the request protection key, the key used to do the AES GCM encryption of the whole structure, and they are themselves encrypted with secrets that are specific to the target host. So that can only be opened by specific target hosts. They are built, of course, uh, with the help of the public host key. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at the scenario. The owner of the guest that wants to use an HSM 
would build such a request. We have tooling to build this re these requests. We look at these uh, later. And uh, he would have a policy in the guests uh, associating uh, master key verification patterns or other configuration uh, data of the HSM with the ID of the uh, association secret. That request is sent to the guest. The guest would submit it to the ultravisor. The ultravisor, uh, if there's a key slot for that machine, will be able to unpack the request, and then the ultravisor has this secret together with the ID. In the next step, the guest would bind the HSM. Then on the bound HSM, it would uh, re request the uh, configuration data, for example, the master key verification pattern. Uh, and checking the policy, if uh, what he gets back and uh, the ID that he just uh, stored, uh, the association secret that he just stored uh, match, then he can do the <laughs> issue, the associa association request. And if he, the guest is paranoid, he checks the master key verification pattern again. Okay, so why it's so good? Is anybody afraid of you? You should, because we have introduced something that we trust. The add secret request containing the association secret. How do we know that on the weight between here and here, the right association secret is used? So we must uh, make sure that the association secret requests are not misused. And there are essentially two types of misuses. One is that someone steals this association secret request and uses uses it for a different guest. And the second uh, misuse could be someone intercepts the request and replaces it by a request association secret adding request of the attacker. And then we talk uh, to possibly to a system that is uh, protected by something that the attacker can uh, mimic. Okay, and that is, uh, well, the part that cost me a few nights uh, to go, uh, come up with solutions for. So there are a few safeguards to uh, disable misuses of these at secret requests. And the safeguards depend on the use cases. And uh, there are two major classes of use cases to me for confidential computing and uh, the second class has two subclasses. So class number one of use case is the owner of the secure execution guest generates a secure execution guest and personalizes it for its, its, his or her own use. So for example, the uh, image has already a dmcrypt key, it has already an SSH key. That is possible with secure execution uh, for Linux on Z because we have encrypted images. Otherwise, you couldn't just put such secrets into an image. Um, that is the use case that is green. The other two use cases are that the tenant, the uh, cloud uh, <coughs> client, takes a image from an ISV. He knows the image is a good one, it has been uh, checked, he knows the measurements of the image, uh, all that is uh, fine, but it's the same image for all clients of that vendor. That image may or may not contain a secret of the vendor, but it does not contain a secret of the tenant, at least not when it's deployed. And now we have can consider two deployment schemes. Deployment key scheme number one, at start of the secure guest, all the data that makes up the guest, including the data used to personalize the guest. Personalizing a guest is the step of start making a generic image, a generic guest, turning it into a guest that belongs to a particular tenant. 
typically a minimum is insert a tenant, uh, a tenant secret into the guest. That makes the personalization. So uh, subcase one, all the data to start the guest and to personalize the guest is available before the guest is booted. The second guess, uh, the guess, se second subcase is the case where the guest is booted and then the uh, personalization data gets, can get created and gets delivered. That makes a big difference. Okay, let's look at the safeguards. First of all, the secret requests are bound to the image. So they have the image measurements in in this uh, at secret request structure. Then I mentioned the second secret that is inside the encrypted part, the extension secret. All at secret requests, you can, may have more than one, must agree on that secret. Uh, so you, that way you make sure that all the at secret requests that you add to the guest come from the same origin from namely the, that subject that knows the extension secret. Okay, now if you have a guest that is personalized to begin with, then there is another secret uh, inside the metadata of that guest that you can bind the extension secret to, making sure that the at secret request only works with that very image. And all the image instances that you started, they belong to the owner of the, uh, to the creator of the image. Good. Well, it looks like, even so that's nice and secure and everything, um, the industry wants something different. They like these generic images more. Um, if the image may be started and uh, as part of an interactive uh, <coughs> attestation process, uh, the personalization uh, takes place, then with our attestation function, which among others gives you a um, configuration unique ID, so a unique ID of a guest image, you can use this uh, unique ID, put it inside your request, and then the request is bound to that very instance of that secure guest, uh, that running secure guest but that can only be done once the guest has been started. So that may not fit all purposes. If it's your purpose, it's a secure thing to do. <coughs> now, if you want to provide uh, your configuration data right to begin with, like an, an IBM product, uh, HyperProtect does this, they have something called a contract that contains all the data that gets read at boot time and uh, in order to personalize the guest and you want uh, the association secret to be part of that contract, then you want to uh, generate the secret request before this guest has been started. So you cannot use something like the unique ID of uh, this uh, started guest. And therefore you can use user data. The user data allows you uh, to put some signature into the additional signature into the uh, at secret request. I will get into that later. Next slide. And last but not least, during the lifetime of a guest, the guest gets more and more insecure. Yes, at the very beginning, the guest is very constrained, doesn't have any I.O., it just does what it was supposed to do, and then the I.O. opens and opens, and all of a sudden you are subject to whatever network attacks. So there is a means to tell the ultravisor at one point in time, do no longer accept secrets, new secrets, which is probably uh, a good thing to do this um, after in the first period of your boot process at some time when you uh, start opening, say, SSH, for example, for the S time, first time. Or or another TLS con connection to the outside. So, um, uh, 
what you can do with this uh, signature is you can actually, the uh, owner of the add secret request can actually uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, sign the request, uh, that would be uh, almost everything of the request. He cannot uh, sign the request structure tag because that is computed at the very end. Uh, but he can sign all other data with exception of the signature itself. And if the contract data that is used and that is, is, is used to uh, uh, personalize the guest contains a certificate. If you want, you can also put the hash of the certificate in uh, that uh, uh, <coughs> field that is uh, reserved for this uh, to verify the signature. Then the guest code uh, can be such that it only uh, submits a secret request to the ultravisor of which the signature can be verified. And given that the guest code belongs, uh, should belong to the uh, guest image, so to the init RDE typically, and therefore has been measured, and uh, the init, meaning that the init RDE cannot uh, easily or cannot be uh, tampered with, you, uh, you are sure that this test is actually performed. As soon as you think the guest is so open that you can no longer trust that code to submit something to the ultravisor, you should better lock the ultravisor to no longer accept further at secret requests. Okay, it has been implemented in Linux. So we have a new device driver to talk to the ultravisor. Uh, we have uh, our crypto device driver has been extended to deal with uh, bindings and associations. There are toolings where you can look at the status uh, and uh, you can actually change the status. Um, the image, uh, we have a, a tool to generate uh, images, uh, generate uh, images for secure execution that is scan prod image and we have new tools to add the secret request that is, uh, <coughs> by the way, these new tools are written in Rust. Um, you can create an add secret request on any platform. You can add the request, of course, only on an IBM Z platform because that uh, part uh, is uh, Z specific. There is a, a sub command to verify the user data if you happen to have this user data and uh, an option to lock the ultravisor for using uh, further secrets. Uh, given that uh, the association of, uh, well, association and association secret with the right uh, uh, HSM is a little bit tricky. We have also a uh, configuration tool that uh, allows you to write policies that do these associations. And this is, uh, <clears throat> just a, a sample of such a policy where you have a name uh, that can be turned into the uh, idea of the association secret and here is uh, well, this hex string is the master key verification pattern and the tool would then use, uh, <clears throat> look for a HSM that happens to have the right master key verification pattern in order to associ associate the right association secret. And that's where that I'm at the end of my talk. So it's non-trivial to use uh, HSMs uh, in a virtualized environment, unless you have a confidential computing environment with uh, similar techniques that I described uh, this uh, time. And well, on IBM Z, we have managed to uh, make this happen for our crypto adapters. Are there any questions? Assuming the HSMs had remote attestation capability to the firmware running on the HSM itself, 
which point in the chain would you prefer to verify the attestation? In, in a way, what I... Well, uh, well first of all, uh, our firmware cannot uh, uh, <coughs> connect to, uh, to an arbitrary HSM. I think it would be sufficient uh, to do this association uh, at the point where I say, I said, uh, we check the master key verification pattern. So what HSM typically is, do have you in, install certificates that you can uh, request. So there are other means than just the master key verification pattern where the uh, HSM can it identify itself. You do not have to generate the image itself, just the header uh, with an additional slot. So you can, well, the number of slots is just um, constrained by the, the size of the header, which is currently, I think, 8 kilobytes. So it's quite a few slots that you can put there. But yes, we know uh, <coughs> it's not really great if the cloud shrinks and uh, <laughs> extends dynamically. Yeah, well. Yeah. Is the infrastructure code um, open or available somewhere? Which code is open? The infrastructure one. Unfortunately not. Um, Do you have I'm not in a company that, <laughs> <laughs> okay. at least for its hardware, is renowned to be very open. You need the arm. No risk five in that respect. And maybe uh, because the provider is only firmware, so it's only source code, right? It's not uh, tied to our, is it tied to a very specific, uh, for example, the Crypto Express support? That is hardware. So well, I understand that it's a uh, uh, intellectual property and all this But the one thing is that with the provider, I mean, do you have some? Do you know if there is some plan to open source it? Because it can really be useful for the world community. To uh, I know that, and I would even be in favor of it personally. But I can you can't make you any hope. <laughs> Too much hope there. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. It's okay. I understand that it does not depend on you only. So, so what is the form factor of this? Is it a PCI? Yes, PCI. And what but the, the uh, but for the op the interface, the operating system sees is not PCI. That is the three instructions that are architected in our instruction set. What does level four certified means? Level four. Okay. This is the scrutiny with that uh, the FIP certification uh, is performed with. So it, it essentially means that uh, we are temper responding, that uh, any attack on the uh, HSM hardware can be detected and uh, not only detected, but uh, in such a case, the secrets in the HSM will be destroyed. So if you get a coil around it, if you think you have to penetrate the coil, or if you want to x-ray it, or if you want to freeze or heat it, or whatever, these kind of things get detected and it uh, gets destroyed. Even if you rip it off uh, the machine, there's... I'm not an electrical engineer, but I trust uh, our electrical engineers that they made it, uh, that then some electrical fluctuations make the adapter realize I'm being ripped off and that it is spoiled uh, secret un unless it has been configured uh, to be unplugged in case you want to transform 
you want to write it, transport it uh, from one place to another. One more question. Thank you.